Luke chapter 12, verse 16. We're going to get into this new series about being made for more. And um, I love kids when they're little because how many of your kids, speaking of the costumes, did any of your kids get really into Batman? Any of Batman kids? Batman fan kids? Yeah, like when my kid, when my sons were three, they're like, I'm Batman. They would, and I'm like, oh, that's cute. And then they would kick me in the shins really hard and say, I'm Batman. And you're like, okay, I know. Um, and because uh, he like believed with all of his heart, I am Batman. And then, or if you had like a daughter, she puts on Ariel's dress or Belle. And she's like, I'm a real princess. Bow. You know, um, okay. Uh, it's so funny how kids, they believe this. Now, Georgia, because she has two older brothers, our daughter, she's not like a princess girl. She's more like, a, I'm Donatello. I'm a Ninja Turtle. You know what I mean? She's, she's kind of different. You know, I think she wanted to be Venom. Now she wants to be Venom. <laughs> She's like, let there be carnage. I'm like, Georgia, it's settled. This is not good. You're a pastor's daughter. This is praying for your husband. Um, but kids believe it, man. They, they, they believe it. They believe I'm a hero. They believe I'm in a royal family. They believe I'm something great is on my life. There's so much potential in me that they believe these things about themselves. And isn't it true that the world just... You know, I think about Step Brothers. I'm a T-Rex. Okay, anyway. Uh, but uh, I've never watched that movie again. This is a movie that Pastor Kate tells me about. I don't watch these things. I read my Bible, and then Pastor Kate tells me about it, and I'm like, oh, that sounds sinful. I'm not going to watch that. But the world, you know, the world, like, has a way of just beating you down, and, you, oh, I get it, and we're keeping it real, and I can't, I'm not really that great, and I'm... You know, I haven't really been, it's not who I am, and, and all of that. And I think it's amazing how we believe so much that this is who we are, and then we just give it up. But I do believe that the Spirit of God has called each and every believer, each and every Christian, to call out that phrase, I'm made for more. I believe that God has called each and every one of us. I believe we have a calling on our life. I believe that there's a mission on our life. I believe that we can live on purpose. And I believe it's the devil's great. Uh, really what he's actively trying to do is trying to get you to not realize who you are, trying to get you to, to not buy in totally to the word of God uh, because he knows what certain disciplines do to unlock the blessing of God, the power of God, the supernatural power of God over your life. And so he just tries to put a monkey wrench, put a stopper, put a kink in the blessings of God and the plan of God. So I wanted to step into this today because I believe what I'm about to talk to you about is one of these things that is essential to a person that says I'm made for more. Luke chapter 12 verse 16 is a parable, which is a fake story that Jesus tells so we understand more about how he feels about things and how the kingdom of God is. So let's take a look at it. And he told them this parable. It says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So that's exciting. Good job. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. That's a smart guy. And there I will store my surplus grain. So he's got all this extra in his life, so much extra. He's got all these cars, and they fit in this garage, but he's got, he's got the Polaris, he's got the Kubota, he's got the Gator. I thought this was Texas. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about? Okay. He's like, where am I going to put this stuff? I mean, there's just so much. Where am I going to put it? And so he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a bigger barn. I'm going to store these. And then he says to himself, You'll have pl plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat. Drink margaritas. This is the Texas version of the NB Mary. He's got a margarita machine. He, he installed it on the inside of the barn. 
Y'all are like, I hope Pastor know, doesn't know I have one in my garage. <laughs> so that's what he's saying. So he's chilling. He's like in there. He's like, he's got his margarita. He's sitting in his new barn. He's looking around. He's like, this is good. I like this. But then God said to him, he sits up, spills his margarita. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself and it says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Your word is so good, and you're so good to us. You're so incredible. God, you're great. And I know that your greatness wants to shine through our lives. And so, Lord, I thank you for this message. I ask that you allow it to minister to hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So we got this guy. And to me, if I'm a Jewish person hearing this story, I'm like, oh, this guy's smart. I like this guy. Amazing, incredible. He's good looking. He's successful. He has so much extra. What a smart plan. And everybody's thinking this guy's great. This is what I want in my life. See, this is the guy I want to be. I want to be the bigger barn guy. And then Jesus just all of a sudden just like totally hits him with a, he's going to die and he's an idiot. And you're like, what? And what we understand is Jesus teaches us that we think that that's what greatness looks like. But what he teaches us is that's not what he thinks is greatness. And this is important because this series being made for more is focusing in on what happens when we do find success in our life. How do we steward success? How do we steward greatness? How do we steward it? The reason I say steward is because Psalm 24 verse 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That word everything in Hebrew means everything. That was a joke. Um, the world and all who live in it. So, meaning every resource, everything we earn, the very chair you're sitting in, everything is the Lord's. The car you drive, the home you have, this church, this city, God is chilling and thrilling in heaven, looking down on all the things that we have, and he's saying, I'll let you borrow it. God's saying, it's all mine. This is all mine. He's got the sombrero hat on, that little meme, you know what I'm talking about? I'll allow it, right? He'll, he's like, I'll let you have it. And so it's all his. It's all on loan. Rena Center's next door. We have to understand that every single thing that we have is because God allowed us to have it. Yeah. It's all His. Amen. And so resources come to us, success because of hard work, you know, sowing and reaping. You sow whatever. I call it lead, uh, lead and lag. That if you don't put any lead in, you won't get the lag that you want. So you have to be able to put the work in to get what you want. You can't just sit around and, and not do the things that you need to do to get the harvest that you want. And so, so many of you, many of us, we've sown hard work and, and you've, re you've reaped successes from that. But some of us, sometimes, just like it rains on the righteous and unrighteous, we have bad breaks, even if we honor God, even if we do that, um, sometimes the grace of God comes on us and we need to understand that we don't, we're not entitled to anything. I'm entitled, I'm a child of God. I sang the song, I am a child of God. Yeah, yes, you have a place in heaven. Thumbs up, man. Well, I'm entitled to be a king on earth. Well, not really. God loves you. God's for you. And sometimes God blesses us by the grace of God, and that's an amazing thing. And so we just say, thank you, Lord. Thank, th thank, thank you for gracing me with this. And thank you that all the increase comes from God. 
because he's awesome. He's just that good. He lets us use his stuff. And we have to understand that he is the God of more than enough. He's the God of more than enough. And I'm thankful that we serve the God that, that whenever we ask, whenever, whatever we need in our life, he's the God of more than enough. It says it's pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's the kind of blessing that God has that he wants to pour out on our life. And, I, and by blessing, I don't just mean finances. I'm talking peace. I'm talking joy. I'm talking relational, relational success in your life. I'm talking the things that are intangibles in life. He's the God of pressed down, shaken together, running over. You know, in my home, my son Judah, it's his job to change the trash. Judah, because he acts like he can't do anything else. Does anybody have kids like this? I'm not really good at sweeping the floor, so you should do it. It's like... I'm going to punch you. Um, so, so I'm like, okay, Judah, you're the one that changes the trash. So what he'll do is he'll take the whole milk carton, throw it in. He'll take all these, like the big bulky stuff, and he'll just put it in. He'll be like, nothing else will fit. And I'm like, bring it to dad. You got to press that thing down, baby. You got you to get in there. You got to put both feet in. You got to stomp down in on it. You got to smash it all down, and I can fit more and more and more. And then, and then what do I do? You, sh you press it down, you shake it up, and then it runs all over the place, and you got the trash juice everywhere. But, yeah. Uh, but this is the kind of, this is a picture of God's, what, of how powerful God is in our life. We don't think that God could cram any more blessing in our life, but he does, press down, shaking together, running over. It's just nuts what God can do in our life. And we have this man, by the grace of God, acquired greatness financially. And his idea is, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to store it. And then he dies, and he's called a fool. What a day. What an amazing day. But why was he not great? Because the scripture says, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? In other words, you could have been great, but you were too late. You could have been great, but you were too late. You could have made a great difference. You could have been generous, but you can't now because you're dead. And so many people in life live a could have been life, a would have been life, but never made a decision and decided I'm made for more. You know, I told everyone weeks ago, I will never feel guilty or shy about teaching the whole Bible. I will preach on heaven and hell. I will preach on sin. I will preach on God's stance on marriage. And just as I wouldn't shy away from those subjects because people think they're taboo, I don't because if Jesus talks about it, guess what? I'm going to talk about it. The Bible talks about it. I'm going to talk about it. Because you need to know about it. Because there is going to be that moment where you stand before God and you are going to have to give an account for your life, just as I will. And I need to humbly come to you every single Sunday and just say, I've sought God's face with a tear in my eye. I preach this word. I know and I stand on the faith that I believe that if Jesus said you need to know it, you need to know it and understand it. And I believe if you read your Bible, you will realize you're made for more. I believe if you spend time in prayer, you will realize that you're made for more. I don't feel guilty about you asking to pray for God, to pray to God. I, I believe that if you've complained more than you've prayed about it, then uh, you're thinking wrong about it. If you go through Summit, you start serving, using your gifts, you realize I'm made for more. And I believe if you develop a generous heart for the Lord, you will realize that you are made for more. Someone who is made for more realizes that everything that comes into my life financially is not 100% for my consumption. 
This is all for me. Everything that comes in is for me, for me, me only, and my family. There has to be a built-in facet to me that says, okay, heaven has given all this to me on loan, and Jesus is up in heaven wanting to see what I do with it. See, most people think, well, I love God with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. I love God. I just love him so much. Okay, but he doesn't know the code to my bank account. That doesn't matter to him. That doesn't matter. But the problem with thinking that, that way of thinking, is that's just not true at all. Like, at all. The truth is God knows how you're spending your money. He cares how you're spending your money. He is into, he is into every single thing about your life. And someone that knows they're made for more says, I need to steward this right. And yes, God does care about what you do with your time. He absolutely cares. He cares if you use your talent. And he also cares about your treasure. He cares about what you're doing, how you're spending it, how you're managing it, what's happening in your world. And we all feel uncomfortable with this, but we have to understand that God, when he looks at everything in our life, we need to start looking at our giving as an act of worship. Just as someone could prophesy or just as someone could be healed on this stage, we can pray over them. And, and just as spiritual as it was watching that young man be water baptized, which I'm pumped about, which God is very pleased about, by the way, uh, I believe that it's just as supernatural and spiritual when you worship God through your giving. And so you need to look at it as, okay, God wants me to pray. God wants me to read my Bible. God wants me to serve. And God wants me to give. It's, it's, it's all together. But what, what, what the devil does is he tries to act like, well, that's Old Testament. That's, we are no longer under that law. And so I just want, I wanted to take just a couple of moments to help you explain, to help to explain where does it come from? Is it New Testament or not? And we'll take a look at some scriptures together. It's going to be fun. Um, so it starts with understanding the concept of the tithe, of the tithe and offering where we can grasp a generous lifestyle. So number one, the tithe is holy and it belongs to God. So whatever comes into my life, whatever increase comes into my life, if it's a check for a thousand bucks, a hundred bucks goes to God. If it's a check for 10,000 bucks, a thousand bucks goes to God. Right off the top. Why? Because God is first. He's first in my finances. God is a God of order. And so he is put first in all things. Time, talent, treasure, he's put first. And so when we look at the concept of the tithe, where does it come from? In the Old Testament, we see an encounter uh, with Abraham and somebody by the name of King Melchizedek, Melchizedek in Genesis 14. Now, this is important to understand, uh, this character named Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a Christophany. It's a pre-incarnate manifestation in the Old Testament of Jesus. Okay? Uh, when Jacob wrestled with the angel, many scholars said that that angel was Jesus because that's how Jesus plays. You ain't going to play with Jesus. He's going to wrestle with you, and he's going to hit you in the hip and get you, give you a little lean. Uh, that's what, anyway, I'm going to ask Jesus about that, playing dirty, not fighting fair. Um, but Jesus, we have to say, just like the Trinity, Jesus is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Jesus is God's Word. And so when God said, let there be light, guess who was making light happen? Jesus was. So we have to understand, it's not just like Jesus is just chill, was just chilling up in heaven, just like, Dad, when can I go to... No, he's, he's been in it all. He's been in it all, and he's weaved throughout the Old Testament, and sometimes they'll show up. If we remember the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're pushed into the fiery furnace, and it says that there was a fourth in the flame. Well, who was the fourth? Jesus. Now we have Abraham, who goes through all these things, Sodom and, and uh, Gomorrah, and uh, he, God brings about a great, great victory, and he encounters this king named King Melchizedek. Now, King Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Uh, king Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem, which Jerusalem means peace, meaning that we can with 
99.999999% assurance know that King Melchizedek is the pre-incarnate Jesus. So here we have Abraham setting up this scenario. Abraham, who is the father of faith, meeting Jesus in the form of King Melchizedek. I wonder what's going to happen. This is, this is like a historic meeting, right? So Genesis 14 says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Now watch this. This is so interesting. I would think that Jesus would be like, Hey, I'm coming. Here's what's going on. Here's what the new covenant's going to look like. He could tell him a bunch of things, right? But he doesn't. He's just there. And Abram, as a result of being in his presence, it says, then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So here's this amazing encounter. The father of faith is there and... God of all things featured the tithe. He could have told Abraham a lot of things, but he just receives the tithe. He's like, okay. Now, why is this important? Because there are multiple times more verses in the Bible that talk about money than deal with salvation, hell, heaven, or anything else. So to ignore scriptures and Jesus' thoughts on money finances, generosity, money management, is to ignore a large percentage of the Bible. So a couple things. Number one, the New Testament teaches when you give to the church, you give to Jesus. So when you give to City Mark, those of you that do tithe, those of you that do give, you don't give to me. When I give to City Mark, I don't give to me. I give to Jesus. That is who I give to. So I can rest assured that when the tithe leaves my hand, it goes into Jesus' hands. And I'm thankful for those hands, those healing hands, those hands that can take what I have and he can multiply and use what I have better than I ever could. And so we look at Hebrews 7 because we're talking about New Testament now, is tithing New Testament. Trying th so Hebrews 7, so Hebrews is all about people, uh, the, the, the writer of Hebrews, which many people would say is Paul, which pretty much is, that the writer is trying to convince Jews who are thinking of bailing on Jesus. Like, ah, I don't know about this Jesus stuff. I kind of want to go back to the temple. I kind of want to, I like the old Mosaic law. And Hebrews 7 is trying to make a case that the priesthood of Jesus is a better priesthood. And Hebrews 7, verse 7 says, um, it's actually talking about Melchizedek. It is referring back to this tithe that takes place in the Old Testament. Now here we are, boom, New Testament, Hebrews. Jesus has done all of his uh, work on the cross, rose again, and... Here's what it says. It says, now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. It says, here, mortal men receive tithes. So it's saying, okay, um, hey, um, you remember how you go into the church and everyone's like giving, everyone's tithing, which suggests that tithing has not stopped since the new covenant started. Make sense? Some of you are like, oh, that's... You know, that's Old Testament. It's now, we're now under grace. Tithing is over. But what the author is suggesting is, hey, the tithing system is happening, still going. And it says that, hey, you remember when you give to the church, the, the priest, they take it in and they get it to where it needs to go. So he's just saying that mortal men receive tithes. So the pastors, the, the priests. It said, but there is... Um, but there he receives them. Melchizedek, Jesus, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. 
So it's a point that the tithes are ongoing and received by mortal men. And when a New Testament believer gives, what Paul is saying is you give to Jesus. When you give, you give to him. And it was to give the New Testament Jew confidence in worship to tithe to Jesus. And listen, how I pastor you, I have to show you how God wishes to be worshipped. Not how I think he wishes to be worshipped. Not how I believe that it should go. Not how I think that this is, this is how I would interpret the scripture. This sounds better because, because here's what I've learned. You will not get through this life in any relationship ever without sacrifice on your part. I want you to imagine me going through my life, oh, Pastor Kate, we love each other, but we're under the law of grace, so I don't really have to do anything for her because I'm under grace. How y'all think my marriage is going to go with that kind of thinking? <laughs> yeah. No. Husbands, you know, it's sacrifice that blesses your wife. Wives, you, it's sacrifice that blesses your husbands. And if we believe that we can be in relationship with God and he's not going to ask from us anything, he's not going to ask for sacrifice, then we don't really understand what it means to be a Christian. Because God is never going to not ask for sacrifice. He is. In Revelation, chapter, uh, Revelation, five of the seven churches, Jesus is not happy with their worship. So Jesus is up in heaven, he's watching the churches, and he's like, yeah, it's, it's not really good. He's not happy with the sacrifices, he's not happy with it. And I made a decision a long time ago, God, I don't want to be the lukewarm church. I don't want to be the church that's ho-hum. I don't want to be the church that's just not really worshiping you the way that you want to be worshiped. So God, how do we worship you in spirit and in truth? And God pointed me to these scriptures so that you understand the way that he wants to be worshiped because I want God to tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. And trust me, you will want to hear that in heaven as well. And we have a lot of teaching going around that's afraid to tell you the truth because it's offensive. But I'm not afraid to offend people. Because I know who I answer to. And I love you, but I don't answer to you. I answer to him, and so do you. So I, just as much as you, have to abide to his word. So do you want to worship God, or do you want to give him a lame sacrifice? I know everybody in this room is like, I would like to give him a lame sacrifice. No. I know that everybody in this room is like, I want to honor God. I love God. I have a desire to do good, great works for him. I know that that's your heart towards God. And so we have to understand how God feels about this area of our life and what he desires from us. We have to understand it. Listen, when people say, well, that's Old Testament, we're under grace, we're under grace, we don't have to do those things any longer, okay? Well, let me just help you understand. Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses and he always upped the ante, right? So Jesus would always say, you've heard it said, but I say, right? This is where Jesus would take the law and then he would put the New Testament little sugar on it, okay? So he came over and said, hey, you've heard it said, do not murder, right? Do not, do not murder, unless you're in Texas and somebody cuts you off. And you're good. Which I've learned. You know, you don't mess with, 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 with people on the road in Texas. You just don't mess with them. You're just like, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sir, go right ahead. Uh, don't run me over with your 10-foot high truck. Um, <laughs> and, um, but he said, you've heard it said, do not murder. But I say people can murder in their 
heart. That ups the ante. You've heard it said, do not uh, have an affair. Do not commit adultery. You've heard that said. But Jesus says, but I say, you can be an adulterer in your heart. Okay? That's the difference between Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, and so the New Testament is about your heart. It's about what's going on in here. Jesus taught where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. So number two, your heart is not a good leader, but a better follower. Meaning, your heart follows your treasure. Your heart follows your treasure. Make sense? So you put your treasure here, and your heart follows. Not the other way around. When I invest in something, I am aware of it constantly. I am always checking in, seeing how it's doing. Right now, some of you, in your pocket, your phone is dinging because of your cryptocurrency accounts. What? Yes. Got it. Amazing. How we handle our money. Listen, you will only get as much out of City Mark as you invest in it. Because when you invest in something, you're always checking in on it. How am I doing? How's that going? How's this going? Okay? How we handle our money is the single greatest indicator and metric to understand where our heart is. Truly. I had somebody tell me the other day, Jesus, not that. Uh, I, I had somebody tell me today, uh, I'm just kidding, by the way. We love babies. I'm not, I'm not mad. It was, it was just cute. Um, um, uh, someone, someone told me today, or the other day, Jesus is a socialist. <laughs> right? Jesus was a socialist. I'm like, okay, let's go there. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> I told you I got to Texas as soon as I could. I've always been a Texan. I'm always ready. Texans are always ready to fight. They're like, I'm ready. <laughs> um, but I'm like, okay, okay, Jesus is a socialist. Got it? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is a socialist. Okay. Um, I asked that person, set Jesus aside. Okay. Show me your bank account and show me how many medical bills you've paid for somebody else. No one is stopping you. No one's stopping you. Because what you're saying is, I want to be generous. Christianity teaches about generosity, and, and I want to be... What you're saying is, you believe that everything should be shared, and everything needs to be equal, and everything needs... Okay, so fine, no one's stopping you, so do it. But what I've learned is, when I said that, there was no response. You know why? Because it was a heart matter. Because the people that are criticize generosity, if I pull up their bank account and I look at the percentage they, that they give towards the things that they talk about, it's normally none to zero. I mean, that's the same thing. <laughs> it's sort of like a very small percentage. So here's what I know. Go ahead and talk. But if there's not actual dollars behind what you're saying, you don't care. You actually don't care. No, but it's not true. You don't. It's just a, it's just a, what I call virtue sig signaling. Right? Let's just get real about it. I'm not mad at anybody. But <laughs> put your money where your mouth is, right? And we all make stupid decisions with our finances, right? I'm in Texas. You know what I think about whenever I get in my car? You know what I think about? Man, I need to have one of those lit teas. You may know what I'm talking about. It's this tea that's like real colorful. It's at these places. It's, it's like this herbal like tea that they make and they put it on ice and they put all these like cool like little like sugar-free like liquids in it. And it's like eight bucks for a tea. Think about that. 
but it's so good. <laughs> and every time I get my car, I'm like, oh, man, I want a lit tea right now. And you know what? I drive by the lit tea place, and I'm like, don't pull in. Don't do it. <laughs> and then I get another one. And then I look at my bank statement, and I'm like, okay, this lit tea, that lit tea, this lit tea, that lit tea. I'm not going to give you the number. Stupid, crazy, insane. I pay a membership fee to this lit tea place, right? We don't think that we do, but add it up over a month. You see what you're invested in. And you know what? Not once did I ever walk into that lit tea place and be like, you know what? Every time I come in here, all you want is my money. You just want my money. You just want to take, take, take. You just give me a bill and you're like, here. And then I have to pay it. And I was like, what have you done with what I've given you? Right? But we get into God's house and all that he's done for us and all that Melchizedek, all Jesus, the king, has done in our lives. He didn't have to. He owns it all, but he lets us have it. He lets us steward it. It's all amazing. And then we think that we can act like he doesn't care about this area of our life. He cares, he sees, and um, it really is a hard issue. And um, when you tithe, you're plugging your bank account into the father of life. And it's not faith teaching. I'm not saying, oh, you're plugging in and God's gonna come down with a big check. I've just realized that God knows what you need and God always delivers what you need. He can deliver financially. Yeah, absolutely. But I know a lot of wealthy people that don't need another check. They need a big old uh, blessing of joy. They need a big old blessing of peace. And you never know, because you know what? Tithing, giving is supernatural. It's it's just supernatural. It's me just taking, and I want you to think, I just plug in my bank account to the Father of life, and I just say, God, I know you don't need this. And he doesn't, by the way. He doesn't need it. It's not about what he needs. It's about what I need. And I want God involved in my finances, and I want God involved in my family's life, and I want God involved in in my life. I, I, I do, in every area. I don't, listen, when I said yes to Jesus, I had to eat the whole meal. I don't just say, oh, well, I I like this. This is cool. I like the loving part. I like the part where it's like Jesus is lovey, dovey, and he's, Jesus is my boyfriend kind of stuff where he, Jesus is just stroking my hair and I'm laying in his arms and he's feeding. This is the kind of Christianity that's being pushed onto everybody. Jesus is my boyfriend. And I actually told Pastor Ben, no more Jesus is my boyfriend type of songs. He doesn't do them because he's got an AR tattooed onto his forearm. Because you know why? Because we forget he is king. He is powerful. He is the he is the light of heaven. He is, when you get in his presence, you're going to fall on your knees. You're going to shake. You're not even going to be able to under, like, you're, his glory is just going to be so powerful when you get around him. And that's who he is. So yes, he loves you. Yes, he's for you. Yes, he's kind. Yes, he's all those things. But he's also going to be coming back soon on a white stallion in all power with the sword in his hand. I mean, dude, he ain't playing. If you think Jesus is playing, he's not playing, man. So we got to stop playing games with God and acting like, oh, well, you know, I mean, God, I don't want this Christianity to cost me this much. No, no. God, listen, (laughs) if you want God's order in your finances, then you need to put him first. And you need to understand that when you put him first, it says that all these things are added unto your life. Not if that he adds unto your life and then you can give. No, he says that when you put him first in all things, then he adds. Then he adds. Listen. I know this church loves the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I just felt like if I don't teach on these things, then you won't know. You just won't know.
And for me, that's what tithing was for me. I just didn't know. Like, I just didn't, I didn't understand. I'm like, why does God need this for me? Why does God want this for me? I just don't get it. Um, but here's what I've learned. When you read the Bible, number three, and this is, and I'm done. When you are generous, you get the attention of Jesus. So I read all these stories on giving. And we read the first one, the parable, right? What does the guy do? He's not generous. What happens to him? He dies. Okay. Cool story, bro. Um, then there's a story of a rich young ruler. He's got it all. He comes to Jesus, the rich young ruler. He's got all the financial, uh, you know, he's done. He's, he's got it. He comes to Jesus. He's like, hey, uh, what do I need to do to get to heaven? And Jesus saw right through his eyes directly into his heart. And Jesus said, you need to sell all your stuff. Not because he's telling all of us to sell all of our stuff. He told that guy to sell all of his stuff because he knew that stuff had him. Not that he had stuff. And Jesus was like, you need to sell all your stuff because you need to have a breakthrough because you think what you own is what makes you. And you need to learn that all you need is me. Did, we, did you know that when he told that guy to sell all of his stuff, he wanted that guy to be a disciple? So that guy could have been in the canon. He could have made, he could have been great. He could have been made for more. But he decided, you know what he did when Jesus told him to sell all of his stuff? He started crying and he said, Jesus, I will. Thank you, God. Thank you for including me. Thank you for thinking of me. And he sold it all and he followed Jesus. And now he's written in the history books. That was a lie. He didn't do that. What did he do? Jesus told him what he needed to do. He walked away. Woo! It said that he was sad and he walked away. Right? And I know this sermon, I already know. Some people, you're going to be like, Preacher. I don't know why you're walking like that, but that you're walking, you're all bowed out. You know? But, but if you'll just hear me, I don't want you to go out like that. I don't want you to go out like that because I don't want to go out like that. I'm not going to go out like that. I am not people. Jesus, imagine this. Jesus would preach sermons and people would walk away. Woo. Dang. That helps me out a lot because people walk away from Jesus' sermons. Can I just help you? If people walk away from Jesus, they're going to walk away from you. And you could be spitting straight gold. And they'll walk away. Okay. So the rich young ruler, he walks away. Story ends. That, that's, that's another story of people that aren't generous towards God. Another one, Judas is watching Mary. She's got a bottle of perfume worth a year's wages, so worth 50 grand. Imagine that. If I had that in my house, I'd be like, don't spray it. Sell it on eBay. Leave it alone. But she takes a 50000 bottle of perfume and she goes up to Jesus and she starts to weep and she, she breaks that perfume over his feet in an act of worship and she washes his feet with her hair. I love that story so much. Sometimes when I think about that story, like I just want to like, I don't even know. I'm a man's man. You know that. But I just want to cry about it because I just, I just, I love that moment of worship. I just love that moment of worship. And Judas is over there watching her. And he's like, you know what? That money could have been used. That 50 grand could have been used for the poor. Jesus was a socialist. Huh? See? See how people sneak it in? See how they're trying to act like they're generous? Judas is generous. Oh, you're so generous. Judas, you're about to sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And you're going to tell this woman that it could have been used for the poor? Interesting. So Judas critiques Mary's sacrifice, her moment of generosity for Jesus. And what happens to Judas? What happens to him? Do you remember? He sells out Jesus and he hangs himself. Okay, so not good. So the theme of not being generous is you die, you walk away from God, and then you die. That's not good. I'm not saying it's going to happen to you. But I don't want... I don't, I don't think that you want that for your life. I don't. But then I look at 
Mary, who made that sacrifice. What does the Son of God say? The Son of God who was there when God said, let there be light, and Jesus was there. I want you to think about if Jesus says something about you. He points to Mary and she says, hey, what this woman has done will be recorded for all time. <sighs> Whoa. Made for more. That's <sighs> Wow. And if you don't think that God is watching, you honor him even in the intimate moments of your life and you don't think that it gets Jesus to stand up in his throne and look and see. That's one story. Another story in the middle of a worship service, everyone's taking up offerings in the middle of the worship service and Jesus is there and he's watching people give. Think about that. Can you imagine me as a pastor? All right, everybody stand up. All right, we're going to gather the tithes right here. Y'all are going to put your tithes right here. And I'm going to make sure it's the full 10. <laughs> Can you imagine that? But Jesus is looking. He's watching it. People are coming in. Says the rich people are coming in. They have gold, and they're just like letting rubies like roll down their arm. Whoosh. And Jesus is watching it splash in the thing. They're giving their tithes. And everyone's like, so they're just like, dollar bills, just bam, 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 bam. And, and Jesus is just watching it. And it says that this old woman, this old widow, this old woman walks up and everybody's looking at her, oh, who's this lady? <laughs> you know, look at that outfit. It's a little stained. And <laughs> she's walking up and then she pulls out just like two little pennies and she lets it fall in and the two pennies just clink into the offering. And, and all of a sudden Jesus stops the worship service. Stop, come here. This woman right here, this woman right here who gave two pennies, she gave more than all y'all in here. I want you to imagine Jesus stopping a worship service to tell everybody it's not an amount, it's a percentage. And y'all thought your rubies, that was worth less than 1% of what you make. Let's just be honest. This woman gave every single thing that she had. And this woman is in the history books. And then finally we have Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is, is, he is rich, but he's rich because he made it off of really swindling people. He was, uh, you know, he was rich because he, he just was a con man. And he gets around Jesus. He starts hearing about Jesus. Jesus is preaching. Zacchaeus, he's short, so he gets in a tree because he can't see Jesus. And he's just thinking, man, I love this Jesus. I watch Jesus on TV. He's my favorite preacher. He's coming to town. Wow. I love Jesus. He gets up in that tree. He's listening to Jesus talk. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, first of all, get down. What are you doing? You're in this tree. Come down. I want to have dinner with you. And that's scandalous because everybody's like, dude, you're with this con man, this dude. And so Zacchaeus gets in his Bentley, which he got with, you know, totally his multi-level marketing schemes. <laughs> Drives to Jesus' house. He sits down and has dinner with Jesus. When he's done, he gets out. I love this. And he gets out his checkbook and he writes a check to every single person that he conned and he pays them back times four with interest. You know why? Because when you get around Jesus and you understand his great love for you and you understand he's made, he's made you for more than, than, than what you can even ask, think, or imagine, this area of your life, it, it's, 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 it's not a big deal. When you love God and you understand, see, I think Zacchaeus just didn't know. He just didn't know. And I think that's where all of us are. I just, I just didn't know. And I can remember being a 20-year-old kid and God saying, hey, you honor me in this area. And I'm like, okay, like, what do you need from me? And I just remember just being obedient in the moment. And I remember many of you have been through Summit. I didn't know that my daughter was going to have a tumor. And I didn't know that we were going to be in the NICU for six months. And I didn't know that it was going to be a $4 million bill to make sure that she was all put back together. But we got the bill, and I'll never forget what I owed on it. A thousand bucks for four million. And God said, I rebuke the devourer for your sake. When you were 20 years old, you didn't know what you were going to need. And am I saying that God's going to cancel medical debt? I don't know, but that's what he did for me. He did it as an intimate financial miracle for me. 
And so what I'm pumped up about whenever I preach on this, do you feel weird about preaching about this? No, because I know how good God is. I know how great God is. I know that when Abraham came and gave the tithe, he understood the greatness of God. When Zacchaeus wrote the check, he didn't, he did, he understood the greatness of Jesus. When the woman, the, the, the widow came, she understood the greatness of God. When Mary came and broke the $50,000 bond, she knew the goodness and greatness of God. And can I just help you that when you, when you come in and you understand I'm made for more and you come and you give God your tithe. He blesses your life in a supernatural way. And so I'm excited and I can't wait to see what God can do through your sacrifice because it, be, it will be a unique and personal miracle that God does just for you. Because he's first. Now what happens is, and I'm done. What happens is we're like, oh, okay, 10%. I can't do it, <laughs> right? And I understand that. So I've developed something called the generosity ladder. And I think they're going to pull it up here. So I'm going to talk you through this. If you've never given ever, you've never given to God's house, you just be an initial giver. Now you say, well, how much is that? To me, I would say that's the level of, if I go into Kroger, come on, if I go to HEB, I'm not coming out of HEB. Like, I could be going in buying a match stick, one singular match stick, and I'll spend 40 bucks. I'm like, how did that happen? I don't understand. Some of you women know what I'm talking about when you walk into Target. That's another story. But, but I would just say, whatever level that is, you know, 40 bucks. You know, whenever I go in, I'm always like, oh, 40 bucks. So maybe it's an initial gift. I can do 40 bucks. Don't think percentages. Just think I'm going to start being generous to God. 40 bucks. Okay? Just whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the amount. Then consistent giver is like you're a really good tipper. Maybe you're like, okay, 40 bucks. I'm going to do 40 bucks every week. You know, God, 40 bucks. That's what I'm going to do. Right? So then you take a next step. Then intentional giver, that's the third rung. And you say, okay, I'm going to do... 5%. Some of you can do 5% today. Some of you can do 7. Some of you can do 8. I don't know what God needs to do. That's between you and him. So that's intentional. Then surrendered is the full tithe, right? Because most of us, we think, I'm really generous. I'm really generous. I'm giving God the tithe. No, you return to God the tithe. The tithe is his. The tithe is holy. So what people will do is they'll take their tithe and they'll split it up into a bunch of different things. No, the tithe is the Lord's. Then anything beyond that is your offering, which is the legacy offering. That's, that's above and beyond your tithe. Does that make sense? So there is a difference. The tithe and the offering are different. The tithe is the Lord's. The offering is where the Holy Spirit says, hey, you need to give this much to legacy, or an offering is you walked into Chipotle and you just felt like you needed to pay for that person's meal. That's an offering. Make sense? So I don't give my offering and then take it out of my tithe. Does that make, does that make any sense? Right? But that's what people do. Oh, that's my offering. I'm, no. So I'm just trying to help you. So legacy is above and beyond your tithe. And that's what we're doing on December 5th. But I just wanted to give you an easy way to look at it to just say, listen, I'm not checking bank accounts. I'm not trying to dig into your whole world. I don't know what's going on. I just know that I'm your pastor. And I feel the obligation to teach you the whole Bible, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And uh, now it's up to you. You know? God loves you. Um, he's for you. Um, listen. Hebrews 13, 16 says, But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. And I want God to be well pleased with you. So I want. So I want. So every eye closed, every head bowed. Some of you are here today and you say, you know, Pastor, I'm not right with God. You know this, we're talking about putting God first and 
every area. Well, you got to put Jesus first, first. And so if you haven't put Jesus first, I'm just going to invite you. I'm not going to embarrass you, humiliate you. I just believe that God has a plan for your life. I believe that God has a call on your life. There is a purpose for you, but you have to say yes to Jesus. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise up your hand. If you say, I need a brand new beginning and start. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise up your hand. One, two, three, quickly. Just raise them up all over this room. Yes, right here. Right here. Right here. Just keep your hand up. We're going to have a friend put a card in your hand right here. And we're going to pray a prayer in just a second. Come on, let's pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin and for my shame. I believe you rose again from the dead, defeated death, hell, and the grave for me. I ask that you wash me, cleanse me, give me a brand new beginning and a brand new start. And for those of you that are in here, and maybe you are going to be water baptized. I know that there are many in this room. You say, I'm going to be water baptized today. I come. I know I'm going to. And then there's some in here that say, I was water baptized as a baby, but I want to be baptized as an adult. Or you have not yet been water baptized since putting your faith in Jesus. Or you say, man, I just want, to, I want a brand new beginning, a brand new start in my life. And I just want to mark that with being water baptized. If that's you in this room. I would just say, I'm going to ask you to boldly, boldly stand to your feet on the count of three and this whole room is going to go absolutely berserk because you're making that decision. If that's you, come on, don't hold back. Don't allow pride to get in the way of this moment. Come on, one, two, three. Just stand to your feet. If you're being water baptized, quickly. Yes, right here, right here. Yes, come on, come on, right here. Yes, yes. Anyone else? You say, that's me. Quickly, quickly, quickly. There's still time. There's still time. Yes, right here. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Quickly, quickly, quickly. There's still time. Five, four, three, two, one. Come on, you got time. Zero. Come on. All right. Come on, church. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet, everybody in this room. If you stood up, I'm going to have them wave over at that door. Can you wave? Wave back. at Yes. You're going to follow back to that door. They're going to get you where you need to go. For those of you that totally punked out and are like, man, I really want to do it, but I didn't want to stand up. You can just slip out, act like you're going to the bathroom, take the quarter around to the left and you can still make it happen. Other than that, we love you guys so much. Can't wait to see you on Tuesday night. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you great, great, great peace. God is for you. See you guys.